Long ago, when the Earth was formed, it contained most of the elements that we recognize today in the periodic table, including elements that are no longer found in nature. This is because these elements, which have disappeared from nature, are radioactive and their short half-lives ensured that they completely decayed between the time of the Earth's formation and the potential discovery by intelligent human. Consequently, there is no natural source of plutonium today. Even if it was present at the time of Earth's formation, with a half-life of 80 million years, no plutonium-244 atoms survived the 4.5 billion years it took for humans to exist and search for such atoms. Neptunium-237 falls into the same category too. Although its half-life is approximately 2 million years, humans only emerged 4.5 billion years after Earth's formation so they came a bit late to the party when it comes to exploring elements. However, there are some exceptions. Radioactive isotopes whose half-life are so long that they still exist on Earth. These nuclei are called primordial radionuclei. They are radioactive but with such long half-lives that they still exist today. The best examples are uranium-238 with a half-life of 4.4 billion years, uranium-235 with 700 million years and Thorium-232 with 14 billion years. Uranium-235 is relatively short-lived, but it requires 10 times its half-life to become significantly depleted, which brings us to 7 billion years, longer than the Earth's 4.5 billion years of existence. However, measuring those isotopes would be lame as they are already well known. Today, we are focusing on somewhat exotic primordial radionuclei. Potassium-40, rubidium-87, lutetium-176 and rhenium-187. So what do we need for this? Potassium chloride, rubidium chloride, lutetium oxide, ammonium perenate and the ultra low level scintillation cocktail. These elements are all extremely long lived beta emitters so they are measured with the LSC liquid scintillation counter. I will elaborate further on the scintillation in the theory. Approximately 100 mg of the salt was dissolved in water and mixed with the scintillation cocktail. Next, I decontaminated all the vials externally with ethanol, not that they are contaminated, but better safe than sorry. Once in the measurement device, they can be measured for over a week. Before I show you the spectrum, let me briefly explain how an LSC spectrum is generated. We have a radioactive sample that the case. The energy of the emitted beta particle excites the molecule of the aromatic solvent, causing them to somewhat collapse light with the scintillation molecules. These molecules then have excess energy and emit this energy in the form of light which then can be measured by detectors. There are three photodetectors arranged at 120 degrees forming a circle around the sample. The number of photons emitted by the scintillator molecule is directly correlated with the energy of the beta particle. Why do we need an ultra low level tritium scintillator? Well, the scintillator itself might contain radioactive isotopes. Considering its structure, one might expect carbon-14 and indeed tritium. Carbon-14 has decayed long ago because the liquid scintillator is derived from petroleum, which has basically no carbon-14. However, extra care was taken to ensure that even the hydrogen atoms are not radioactive as the measured sample has half-lives in the tens of billions of years and it would interfere significantly with the measurement. Moreover, this scintillation cocktail works well with higher salt concentration like the 100 mg in 10 ml of volume in our case. Let's take a look at the spectra. Starting with potassium-40. It has a natural isotopic abundance of only 0.0117%. It's primarily a beta minus emitter with a half-life of 1.28 times 10 to the power of 9 years, a maximum beta energy of 1310 kilo electron volts and an average beta energy of 560 kilo electron volts. It also undergoes electron capture and beta plus decay. The orange peak are the triple coincidences. These are potassium photo decays from our samples, while the dark portion below is the blank measurement, so without potassium chloride added. The peak on the far right side is also from potassium 40, but these are the 1460 kilo electron volt gamma rays coming from natural radioactive background outside, passing through the detector wall, undergoing a photoelectric effect and causing additional signals. We used 204 milligrams of potassium chloride for the measurement and were able to measure an activity of 3 becquerel of potassium 40, which is 7% below the calculated value. 
Next is rubidium-87, which accounts for 28% of all natural occurring rubidium atoms and decays 100% into strontium-87, with a half-life of 4.8 times 10 to the power of 10 years. It has a maximum beta energy of 282 kiloelectron volts and an average beta energy of 81.7 kiloelectron volts. Since the beta energy from rubidium-87 is significantly lower, I've marked the triple coincidences in red and the double coincidences in blue. These double coincidences typically indicate lower energy decays such as those observed with rubidium. We used 298 milligrams of rubidium chloride and measured a rubidium-87 activity of 170 becquerel, which is 3% below the calculated value. Lutetium-176 is a 100% beta minus emitter decaying with a half-life of 3.8 times 10 to the power of 10 years into hafnium-176 and emits beta particles with a maximum energy of 593 kiloelectron volts and an average energy of 182 kiloelectron volts. The red peak represents triple coincidences and the blue ones are double coincidences. Beneath that lies the blank which appears shifted due to the high salt concentration leading to a quench, something I will explain about a dedicated video about the LSC. We measured 16 becquerels of lutetium, which is 1.6% above the calculated value. Above that? Well, the literature is simply incorrect. Okay, that's a bit exaggerated, but it's really not that very accurate. The half-life of lutetium-176 in the literature has an inaccuracy of several hundred million years. Although over the last two years we've taken a bit more precise measurement to determine the half-life of this isotope, the paper has not been published yet. Hence, this single measurement for the video lacks strong evidence regarding the half-life of lutetium. Statistically, we've only gathered data for 12 to 24 hours for this video and our source for isotope abundance may have errors. However, if you want me to, I can delve into the measurement of the half-life of lutetium a bit deeper in another video. Lastly, let's talk about rhenium-187. It's a beta minus emitter decaying with a half-life of 5 times 10 to the power of 10 years into osmium-187. It is a extremely low energy beta emitter with a maximum energy of just 2.65 kiloelectron volts and an average energy of 0.6 kiloelectron volts. But which shocked me the most is the isotopic abundance of 62.6%, meaning that more than half of all naturally occurring rhenium atoms are radioactive. The orange signal represents double coincidences along with the blank measurements. Now I'll compare this with the triple coincidences and this small difference in the triple coincidences from the background. This is our rhenium 187. We used 100 milligrams of ammonium perinate and measured a rhenium 187 activity of 6 becquerel, which is 96% below the calculated value. Of course, there are many other primordial radionuclei, but their longer half-lives would require an unreasonable amount of time measuring using an LSC. I won't conduct measurements for six months just for a YouTube video, I'm sorry. So which other are they? Right, that's quite a bit. Therefore, if you have any of these elements at home, whether in pure form or as a salt, you can claim to possess a primordial radionuclei. Or, even cooler but heavily exaggerated, you have something radioactive at home. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye!